Okay, welcome back. Um, looks like I, well, I just did this one behavioral circumscription in the previous episode, just a few minutes ago. And, uh, yeah, we weren't able to get any of these things, were we? I mean, I hate Googling around for stuff. Oh, there you are, Iron Wolf. COVID-19, I wonder what that is. Hey, well, there we go. Thank you. All right, so we got ruling out solutions to Pryor's Dilemma for Hume's Law. Okay. But yeah, Googling stuff is annoying. Um, shoot. Wait, come on. Alright, so this is the site. Let me, uh... Yeah, so you can download... This from, uh... So yeah, you can download the uh, the link from uh, this site now, and that's up. So if you do that and get it, I will fix it hopefully so it's in the uh, description of the video. Alrighty, so what are we doing? We are opening up the file. Brilliant. Okay, so we got 18 pages of double spaced stuff. We, you know, I'm gonna skip the abstract and just get right into this. So, recent solutions to an old problem in meta ethics share a theme that the normativity of a sentence is a matter of what it rules out. If an assertion forecloses a normative possibility, then it says something normative. If not, it's descriptive. descriptive. I want to challenge this idea. Although there would be general philosophical value in having an account for normative sentences, most views are motivated by A. N. Pryor's dilemma for Hume's no ought is from no ought is no ought from is doctrine. Understood as the idea that no normative assertion no normative sentence can be val validly inferred from descriptive ones. The dilemma goes as follows. Start with an obviously descriptive claim. All fire hydrants are red. This implies Either all fire hydrants are red, or stealing is wrong. Then choose whatever definition of normativity you like to will be either normative or descriptive. If it's normative, then we have a counterexample. If it's descriptive, then we, ha then we make to a premise and add the descriptive sentence, not all fire hydrants are red, to infer stealing is wrong. And again, we have a counterexample. This paper considers four related views which aim to block Pryor's objection and enable formal proof of a Hume-like inference barrier. Each defines a normative sentence as one that depends on, for its truth value on some other uncontroversially normative thing, but the views differ on what that thing is. For Greg Restall and Jillian Restall, Russell, it's a set of morally satisfactory worlds in a, modal, a model of deontic logic. Campbell Brown, offers two possibilities, the truth or falsity of moral nihilism and the extinction of normative predicates. For and for Daniel Singer, it's the plans of it's the plans of Alan Gibbard's normative semantics. Together they call them the ruling out approach. There are two acknowledged adequacy problems for these proposals. Some normative sentences aren't dependent in the relevant ways, and two, some descriptive sentences are I will argue that attempts to explain these problems away don't succeed, and that there are unacknowledged concerns beyond inadequacy. These difficulties suggest it's harder to give a good answer to Pryor's challenge than many suppose, but at the very least, they offer an invitation to consider whether solving it is needed to make sense of Hume's insight in the first place. 
The challenge in responding to prior is defining normativity and descriptivity for sentences so that two comes out non-normative as a conclusion in the first inference and non-descriptive non -descriptive as a premise in the second. While many responses focus on how individual terms operate, operate in each argument, the ruling out views are built around the truth functional behavior of whole sentences. Restall and Russell dis identify dependence on models of deontic logic as the marker of normativity. A sentence is normative if and only if for any model where it's true, there is an alteration to the set of satisfactory worlds that changes its truth value. Normative for any model where it's true, there's an, all right, changes its truth value. And descriptive if it isn't sensitive to the set, set of satisfactory worlds in any model where it's true. Okay. In other words, a sentence says something normative just in case its truth always rules out a possible way for normative things to be, and descriptive if its truth never does. Brown highlights ontological commitment in his first definition. A sentence is normative if and only if it's false in every model where nothing satisfies a normative predicate and descriptive otherwise. That is, a sentence says something normative just in case it requires that at least one thing satisfy a normative predicate. Or in, or just in case it rules out moral not, or just in case it rules out moral nihilism. Brown's second definition is similar to R, but cast in terms of the extinctions of predicates rather than models of deontic logic. Yeah, fair enough. B two a sense of normative if and only if there is a way of fixing the extinction of normative predicates that's inconsistent with it and descriptive otherwise. So a sentence says something normative just in case it rules out a possible assignment of objects to normative pre says something normative just in case it rules out a possible assignment of objects to normative predicates. Yeah. <coughs> Singer takes a similar approach to R and B two. But classifies sentences using Gibbard's 2003 semantics. Let a plan be a set of instructions for what to do in any possible circumstances or circumstance and let a world be a maximal set of circumstances so that the content of a sentence is given by all the world plans world plan pairs compatible with it this enables singer to define descriptive and normative senses as follows s a sense is descriptive if and only if every world compatible with the sense is paired with every plan and normative otherwise here a sentence says something normative just in case it rules out a plan for pairing with a compatible world. Yeah. So the normative is uh, cutting off some of the uh, descriptive possibilities. These proposals create responses to Pryor's dilemma. Restall and Russell classify as neither normative nor non-descriptive because it, its first disjunct is descriptive and second is normative. Its truth doesn't rule out normative possibilities in every model, just models where not all hydrants are red. <coughs> Excuse me. For Brown, conclusions are evaluated on their own, while premises are evaluated together. Thus, on B1, two is a dis two is descriptive as the conclusion of the first inference because every hydrant could be read even if all normative predicates were empty. But it makes the premises normative in the second case because the conduct of two and three is true only if stealing is wrong. Right, let me see if I understand this properly. One of conclusion of the first sentence because every hydrant could be read even if all normative predicates. Oh, okay, because if all normative predicates were empty, yeah, an extinction. Oh, okay. Similar things go for B2. Wait, is that the extinction one or not? Um, it's just the models. Um, they're similar. It should be okay. Similar for B2, a descriptive is conclusion because it doesn't rule out any way of fixing normative pred predicates when every hydrant is read, while the premises of the second argument make normative are normative because the conjunct of two and three does, namely ways that make stealing wrong. On Singer's approach, conclusions are evaluated in conjunction with the premises. Under S, the argument with two is a conclusion as a conclusion is descriptive because it does, doesn't rule out any plans for theft given that every hydrant is read. But when two is a premise, adding that not all hydrants are red means the premises do not rule out such plans. This whole sentence approach to Pryor's Dilemma improves on the term approach by offering straightforward proofs of an inf inference barrier which utilize the following general strategy. 
If the truth of a conclusion is dependent on some set for its truth value, but the premises aren't, then the arguments can't be valid. By hypothesis, there will be a model satisfying the premise that doesn't satisfy the conclusion. Yeah. Suppose premises phi are indifferent to what's in the set n, while conclusion psi is dependent on n. Then a case of n is possible where phi are true and psi are false. It's false. Yeah. The four proposals of the ruling out approach have some acknowledged drawbacks. One is that while its treatment of mixed disjuncts like two might be acceptable, it gives less pal palatable results for seemingly normative conditionals equivalent to mixed dip disjuncts, in particular conditionals with narrow deontic scope. Five. If Sally is able, she should give to charity. Yeah, this is the ought of uh, deontic logic here. All drivers ought not to text. Well, these are misclassified as either non-normative or descriptive. Okay, I didn't, yeah, see, I'm not familiar with this literature, so I'm not sure how you classify these sorts of sentences or why they're classified one way or the other, but okay, I'll have to take author's word for this. Under inclusion problems for R, under inclusion problems for R were originally raised by Vranus, but it will be instructive to consider them here for similar problems arise for the other versions of the approach. On R, five and six come out non-normative. And five, this is because it's true in models where Sally can't on it. Oh, the hypothetical gets here, yeah. Can't own it and no changes to the set of satisfactory rules will alter that. The same holds for six in all models where there are no drivers, yeah, because the uh, if you the empty set would uh kill this okay i see what's going on models where there are no drivers its truth value is preserved no matter what is in the satisfactory set brown's b1 calls both senses descriptive some models where nothing satisfies a normative predicate are models where five and six are true namely those where sally can't donate and where there are no drivers they were also descriptive under b2 as brown observes since no way of fixing the extinction of normative predicates is sufficient to rule them out they would still come out true in any vacuous case. Things are more complicated with S because Singer has two ways of asserting, assessing normativity. To uh, test for normativity full stop, we apply S to a sentence considered on its own. To assess a conclusion for relevant norm normativity, we apply S to the conjunction of it and the premises to limit the worlds of evaluation to those where the premises are true. This requires any relevant normative sentence to be part of an argument. Taken alone, 5 and 6 would be normative because their content excludes respectively pairs where Sally, Sally is able to donate, but the pair plan doesn't call for. And worlds where there aren't drivers, but the plan doesn't require abstention from texting. But were we to infer 5 from, or 6 from the claims that Sally is unable to donate or that there are no drivers, they would not be relevantly normative since the world's Compatible with the premises can be paired with any plan, donating or not, texting or not. This is why Singer claims his view doesn't have the problems with conditionals. That's plausible as far as it goes. But it does create two distinct understandings of normativity, where prior challenge us, challenges us to give just one. Under full stop normativity, it's the it's easy to find counterexamples to the no off from is doctrine. The two inferences in the previous paragraphs, for instance. Yeah. So relevant normative so relevant normativity is the sense that matters. And in the sense that five and six are non normative on their own because they aren't part of an and in that sense five and six are non normative on their own because they aren't part of an argument. Of course, Singer is unlikely to agree with this characterization. He writes as though there is one definition of normativity with a provision that, in the context of an argument, we are to consider the conclusion in light of the truth of his premises. But this is just another way of saying that there are two approaches to normativity, albeit closely related ones. On the other hand, one might think that Singer employs just a single notion of normativity, the relevant one, where sentences don't occur in an argument are evaluated relative to an empty set of premises. But this is an implausible way of understanding the content of such assertions, and no one blanks out the premises. 
The conclusion of a valid argument is true in every model of the premises and on the assumption that the empty set is compatible with every model. This would mean ordinary declarative sentences are being asserted as true in all models as with tautologies. So any conditional where a normative term has narrow scope can create problems for a ruling out approach. Yet here are two reasons to think that at least some such conditionals are genuinely normative. Okay, here we go. Finally getting to something. First, the antecedents of the antecedents of five and six plausibly suggest that more than material relevance to the more than material relevance at the answer plausibly suggest more than material relevance to the obligations imposed by the consequence. For this reason, some may prefer to treat them as indicative conditionals, which don't guarantee the truth which don't guarantee truth when an the antecedent is false. But the ruling out approach hopes to define normativity within the framework of standard logic, where all conditionals are given material conditionals. Even on this supposition, though, it needn't follow that mixed conditionals and narrow scope conditionals should get the same categorization. The pragmatics of each may be relevant, unless we are certain that truth functional behavior is all that matters to normativity, but that's part of what it's an issue in evaluating the ruling out approach for adequacy. Second, many real world normative claims must be conditionalized in this way, since we often don't have all the relative information. Okay. Uh, all right, so, yeah, it's not my area, so not a ton to say, but it, it, um, yeah, I'm kind of on board with some of these, uh, this reasoning in this area. It seems, uh, reasonable to, uh, if you're going to make these arguments, you want these sorts of things to be in play. You want, uh, to be able to have conditionals in this way. So one adequacy problem is under inclusion. To be clear, it's not that conditionals like five and six are misclassified as non-normative in vacuous cases. It's that they're misclassified in all cases, both vacuous and non-vacuous. There's also an over-inclusion problem on B1 and B2. Contradictions and other necessary falsehoods are normative regardless of the terms that appear in them. They are false in every normative empty model and no, and no way of fixing sanctions within them and inconsistent, inconsistent with them B2. The problem doesn't arise for R since it takes all normative senses to be true at least in one model. Whether S calls contradictions normative, relevant, or full stop depends on whether we should think of every plan as pairing with every world when no worlds are compatible with the sense. Hmm. Intuitively, the answer seems to be no, or at least that each plan would pair with each world only in the vacuous sense. Perhaps we could use the empty set as the compatible world and model contradictions by pairing each plan with it. The trouble is that this would give the content of contradictions as effectively the set of all plans, and this seems wrong. Okay. The over-inclusion of contradictions may seem like a tolerable problem, but I think it would be a mistake to brush it aside. Hmm, yeah. To classify necessary falsehoods as normative would be to render the normativity of a sense independent of its non-logical vocabulary. This is a substantial and controversial commitment. If, as I suggest in section five, it's possible to make sense of human insight without it, it might be better to avoid it. Additionally, there is some reason to think sentence normativity does depend, at least in part, on the meaning of its non-logical vocabulary. By analogy, consider the discomfort many feel for the validity of the inferential necessary p to uh, obligatory p in standard deonto deontic logic. A plausible explanation of this discomfort is that the ob obligatoriness of a sentence must have something to do with its substantive content. If we accept this, then it would be odd if we didn't accept it for normativity, normativity more generally. Okay. Ideally, proponents of the ruling out approach would be able to explain away the under and over inclusion problems. The value have of having an account of sentence normativity that solves Pryor's dilemma and enables proof of a Hume-like inference barrier might make adequacy concerns more tolerable. Brown hopes to do, th do this by observing that a universals con can conversationally implicate ex existentials, meaning that six implicates seven. Some driver ought not to text. So that's a, there exists, so I guess some existential uh, force behind this. Which is normative for, on all four ruling out proposals. 
This would explain why they appear normative but actually aren't. Second, he notes that B contradicts contra uh, notes that B contradictions are weird, so their normativity shouldn't be any more surprising than other weird features. I mean, is that hand waving away? It's like, oh, that's weird. So, I don't know. Yet it's not clear that these explanations will diminish either problem. First, A doesn't cover non-quantified conditionals like five because they don't appear to implicate any other clear, <coughs> clearly normative sentences. This may controversial conversationally implicate the epistemic possibility of the antecedent, but it doesn't help with five since that since the claim that it's possible for Sally to donate is descriptive on all four ruling out proposals. It's indifferent to what satisfactory are, whether normative, normative predicates are satisfied B1 to the extinction B2 and compatible with all plans S. Second, A seems inconclusive even when restricted to just universals. This is because impl implicature need not be independent of semantic classification as I suggested above. The idea that a sentence merely appears normative because it tends to communicate something normative walks a fine line. If the pragmatics of deontic universals explain why they seem normative, this also makes them a natural explanation for why they are normative. Indeed, since valid implication is the mechanism of ruling out, the similarly, the similarly, the similarity, blah, 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 losing it. Similarity between implication and implicature makes it plausible to think a sentence is normative if it rolls out another normative sentence by implicature as well. Third, A gives up the game to some extent. Universals like six are paradigmatic, paradigmatically normative for sentences like for sentences for prior and features and feature in his original examples. The ruling out proposals thus give solutions to the dilemma that prior could not accept as an explanation for for including contradictions and necessary falsehoods, it's not obvious that B is relevant to whether they are genuinely normative. Although they do have weird features and some philosophers consider normativity weird as well, it's not clear that they are weird in connected ways. Contradictions are semantically weird while weirdness of normativity is usually taken to be metaphysical or epistemic. Hmm, this is, yeah. I don't, yeah, I just don't know. Like, I feel like I should have something to say here, but I just can't think at the moment. I mean, it's only been like one glass of wine, really. One and a half now. But, yeah, I'm just not, this is not processing for me in some sense. I'm not exactly sure what really is going on. So, you've got some logic that's ruling out stuff, but, and that's supposed to represent normativity, but I'm just not quite, um, getting the proposal here is, is, is too bad because it seems like it's interesting five there are also unacknowledged concerns for ruling for ruling out of, there are also unacknowledged concerns for the ruling out approach first the adequacy adequacy problem discussed above seems to come from making normativity a relational feature of senses rather than an intrinsic one that is making it a functional a function of its inferential relationship with other senses prior's own conditions of normativity having an essential connection uh, not essential occurrence of normativity of normative vocabulary and bringing something into the extinction of a normative concept are intrinsic features of senses i think prior is right to treat an intrinsic view as the default, so it would be good for the ruling out approach to give some independent motivation for departing from it. Singer argues that Hume's doctrine is only meant to govern arguments where normative aspects of the conclusion are relevant in light of the truth of the premises, because Hume is best understood as making an epistemic point about kinds of premises, what, uh, what kinds of premises move moral inquiry forward. If relevance were clearly a matter of ruling out other normative things, then we could adapt this reasoning to a broader motivation for the relational approach. But this is far from obvious. We might agree with the relevance in interpretation of Hume, but make normativity intrinsic rather than relational. Relational. Indeed, this is a strategy of Shorter, Jackson, Pigden, and Schertz, who adopt the term approach to sense normativity. Uh, as I mentioned above, Term views have their own problems as responses to prior, and the ruling out approach does make proof of an inference barrier more straightforward. So it would be tempting to find motivation for the value of giving an easy proof of Hume-like thesis. 
but this can't provide an independent reason for taking the volitional attack since the viability of Hume's doctrine is part of what's at issue in, resp in responding to prior. What's really needed are meta-linguistic considerations supporting the ruling out approach, that is, reason to think it gives some other kind of explanatory advantage, but it's unclear what those might be. Second and relatedly, the ruling out approach invites meta-linguistic objections RB, as RB2 and as a period to turn moral nihilism into a paradox. Consider, every normative sentence is false. On R, A tells us that our deontic model is empty. But in such a model, adding worlds can make some normative senses true. If we add a world where people steal, the model will now sa satisfy stealing is permissible. So call so R calls 8 normative, meaning that 8 is true only if it's false. Similar things for go for B2 and S. Well, hold on one sec. I'm a little confused as why this music is going. I'm going to get knocked off YouTube, unfortunately. That was not supposed to happen. I was supposed to loop. Hmm. All right, so we'll skip that one. Yeah, YouTube's gonna knock this one down, unfortunately, I fear. Yeah, because uh, the music went to... Uh... Uh, Prodigy. And uh, that tends to get you uh, knocked off YouTube if you have too much Prodigy. It's a... Uh... Well, we'll see. Hopefully it won't. I'm gonna get like a bunch of YouTube... I've already got a bunch of YouTube strikes for these videos. Okay, getting back. On R. It tells us that our Deontic model is empty, but in such a model, adding worlds can make some normative sentence true. If we had a world where people steal the model and are satisfied Stealing is permissible, so R calls 8 normative, meaning that 8 is true only if it's false. <laughs> Similar things go for B2 and S. Every model of normative predicates but one, the empty saint, make it false, so it's normative according to B2. And it's normative on S because no plan is, is in its content. Realms B1 doesn't face this problem because 8 is true in every model where nothing satisfies a normative predicate. To the extent that this concern is related to the liar paradox, one way of responding would be to take a Tarski-like approach, treating assessments of truth like eight as part of a second order mental language and exempting them from classification as no normative or non-normative. Tarski hierarchy. There are some drawbacks to this, to this, both because it's unclear that attribution of truth and falsity are part of the object language and human doctrine is meant to govern, and because being able to count assertions of the type what A said was true, as normative in certain cases, represents an import improvement on the of the ruling out approach or, over term-focused views. While a full discussion of this problem is likely beyond the scope of this paper, it perhaps it's sufficient for present purposes to suggest that the appearance of this kind of paradox con constitutes a pro tanto reason against any conception of normativity that invites it just. As Tarski thought, the conception of truth that invites the liar paradox is, to that extent, problematic. Yeah, it might just be safer to avoid the whole problem. A third worry applies to all four ruling out views. Each definition makes a sentence consistency, a sentence's consistency with other elements of normative semantics, the test of its normativity. The trouble is that consistency and inconsistency are matters of implication. Seen in this way, the ruling out approach boils down to the idea that a sense or sense of premises is normative just in case it implies something normative, namely the falsity of another normative sense. The, motiva the motivating intuition behind the proposals, that meaning lies in what's ruled out, might have been prima facie plausible as a standalone approach to categorizing senses without the additional commitment of rescuing humans' doctrine from prior. In this context, however, it runs a risk of uncomfortable circularity, since it appears to be the no ought from is thesis. Since it appears to build the no ought from is thesis into the very idea of sentence normativity. You know, if it is fundamental, that might not actually be a problem. You know, it's like 
if you're gonna if you really think there's no optimism maybe that's not a dis uh, might be a logical discovery and then you can just uh treat it like uh, by valence or something maybe in light of everything above, I'm inclined to think that the ruling out approach does not give successful responses to prior, as the four proposals are driven by dissatisfaction with the earlier term-focused views, it's safe to say that if one, do one of them doesn't work, proponents would agree we don't yet have an answer to his dilemma. The wide range of proposals for getting around the dilemma suggests that many think there is something deeply wrong with prior's argument, indeed many philosophers I've spoken to about it think prior must be cheating in some way. While I don't think the dilemma is cheating to the extent that participants in this debate are correct that Hume's point was an epistemic one, logic tricks like priors matter. I want to make an alternative to logic tricks. Wait, logic tricks like priors matter. Oh, they they what logic logical tricks like priors matter. I want to make an alternative suggestion for where he's gone wrong, at least as his up. up argument applies to Hume. Okay, so this whole setup is to show that nothing really satisfied what Lyre said, which was that little logical, uh, the logical addition at the beginning, which really sort of threw the monkey in the wrench of this sort of logical applica uh, approach to the no ought from is discussion. So, okay. I mean, I understand that, but I mean, it's a... Uh, yeah, I had trouble just processing all those different arguments at that time. But okay, I understand where they're going with this. Ryan makes two assumptions that are worth thinking about. First, he assumes that a defense of the no ought from is doctrine requires some account of seventh sentence level normativity, and those who respond seem to assume this as well. This is both natural and desirable. Yet the difficulties in finding adequate criteria of sentence normativity suggest that it may not be possible to give this account, in which case it would seem that Prior's challenge can't be answered. If that's true, we might simply conclude that Hume was wrong, but this would be unfair since he never explicitly adopts a sentence level dis distinction between ought and is. Rather, in the famous passage from the treatise, he speaks pr of propositions connected with oughts and ought nots. It doesn't seem obviously wrong to understand this as a sentence level distinction, but neither is it obviously right. It would be at least as natural to read it as distinguishing normativity and descriptive terms while remaining sil silent on whole sentences. Okay, so if Hume was talking about like term implication, yeah, I'm not sure where. Yeah, I'm not sure how that would run, but okay, that's fine. If you're not, there are multiple levels to look at, not just sentence levels. Um, so the uh, that the whole sort of uh, approach is a, it, it may be desirable, but it may not be the right approach. Second, Pryor assumes that defending the doctrine means committing to an inference barrier in modern truth functional logic. There are a number of questions about whether Hume was making a point about logic, but Pryor doesn't seem to be taking a stand on this. Indeed, he doesn't mention Hume at all. Rather, the assumption is that only the only way to get something of contemporary philosophical significance out of Hume's point is to cast it first and foremost as an inference barrier. Since Hume explicitly mentions deduction, it's clear that his point must have had some connection to valid implication. Nevertheless, we need not take this to mean that the primary upshot of Hume's insight is an inference barrier. Charles Pigden observes that some readers of Hume, including Bentham and Moore, took the point to be chiefly a semantic one. Moral language cannot be defined in non-moral terms. You know, that's kind of how I thought about it, too. I must have, someone must have told me that at some point. Yeah, uh... Yeah, I mean, this must have been what I was taught, because I don't think about this stuff otherwise, and so told to me. Combined with a focus on term on terms rather than sentences, this reading makes possible a rational reconstruction of Hume where the failure of interdefinability between normative and descriptive terms means that no argument can move from premises without an ought to a conclusion with one on the basis of meaning. There would still be other ways to introduce to introduce an ought, that is uh, for example, by the rule of addition from a contradiction, but these aren't in the scope of Hume's insight, so understood. To be clear, rejecting prior assumptions doesn't solve the dilemma, it sidesteps it. 
This reconstruction is at least consistent with Hume's original thought and has some virtues. For one, it explains the motivating examples generally given for the doctrine. These inferences, like everyone wants power, so you ought to give it to me, which aren't formally valid, and so if they were valid at all, it would have to be in virtue of meaning. Additionally, a semantic barrier isn't susceptible to prior style attacks in the way a semantic barrier isn't susceptible to a prior style attack in the way an inference barrier is and maintains compatibility with the ought implies can doctrine, as I've argued elsewhere. Finally, in this interpretation, finally, this interpretation preserves the sense that prior doesn't show Hume is wrong. Rather, what prior shows is that that one popular way of understanding Hume is mistaken. Excuse me. So there's a case to be made for preferring this version of the doctrine. Still, the present discussion is about giving accounts of normative language. Although the semantic barrier view of Hume can't be forced by a prior style dilemma to give a criterion for distinguishing normative and descriptive terms, it would still be good to have one. Yeah, um, just because something's in semantics doesn't mean you can't give like some logic for it. It'd still be good for uh, criterion and stuff. Something here. I therefore like to close with the tentative thought, the basic ruling out idea, that the possibilities foreclosed by a sentence are a guide to what kind of assertion it is, might be modified by, into a promising count of normativity for terms. Rather than considering what's ruled out by the truth of a sentence, we would look at what's ruled out when a term in a term in a particular sense is satisfied. That there may be some initial stumbling blocks to directly adapting any of the four proposals considered here into a view of normative terms, but this possibly deserves further exploration. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sometimes I fall down on things I would rather know more about, but this was not that day that I was able to do well. Um, sure. Okay, so if you're going to look at a bunch of Like ways that if you make a thesis in terms of logic and then you're able to show that all the different theories of, of inferences that are supposed to go through in certain ways don't. Okay, that's fine. So this sort of shows, yeah, so this is a sort of a negative paper. It rules out a bunch of things does and gives a positive alternative at the end, but doesn't really flesh that out. So it's kind of interesting if you are interested in the sort of logical accounts of uh, meta ethics and uh, or ethics, and so you're into meta ethics. This is not. This is kind of interesting. I just don't. I mean, it, as the author says, it, it sort of turns on how you understand. Um, no ought from is. So. Okay. Alright, not much more to say, thanks for watching, and uh, hope to see you soon, leave a comment or let me know what you want to see me review, I mean, I'm open to basically any old thing. Have a good day, stay safe folks.